You guys should really look over her shoulder, though. It's like the, it's, it looks like the Matrix, sort of like inverted. I it's, does anybody know what trisodecophobia is? No. Yes. Fear, of the Fear of the number 13. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, how is everybody? Do we have freelancers in the house? Yes. All right. Awesome. So we're ready to start? Okay. All right, we're going to go. So my name is Nathan Ingram. I am from Birmingham, Alabama, where uh, we will have WordCamp in August, by the way. How many of you are from Birmingham-ish? The South. <laughs> okay, so we have the best hashtag ever. It's WP Y'all. <laughs> and we have WPYall.com, and the website is up, so go check it out. We're accept Calls for Speakers is open. Call for Volunteer and Sponsors are open, so check that out. I'm the lead organizer this year. I'm also the host at iThemes Training. That's a significant portion of my time. Uh, I do live webinars two or three times a week on iThemes Training. Most of them are free. It's like going to WordCamp all year long, so it's learning WordPress stuff, lots of cool stuff. I'm also a freelance business owner, have been since 1995, been doing this a long time. I have a small agency in Birmingham where about half my time is still spent doing client work these days, and I'm also a business coach for WordPress freelancers. I uh, just celebrated 22, is that right? No, that's old, 23 years uh, actually in business, so been doing this a little while, and I usually start a talk like this, I did the last one, with the statement that I'm not an expert in any of this. I've just made enough mistakes where I can share those mistakes with you guys. So there's 10 things I'm going to share you today uh, about what I wish I'd known about freelancing. If any of those things resonate with you, let's talk after, seriously. I, I come to WordCamps and <coughs> spend time with people here specifically because I am a huge believer in having your own business and not being beholden to anybody else to set your priorities in life. And what I've seen happen over and over and over again is that people go into business, and it's usually about a year, 18 months in, they hit the same walls. And there are simple answers to all those things. So I love to help people figure that out. Anyhow, um, all right, so let's get into this. We'll, uh, we'll take questions at the end, by the way. We we'll, should have plenty of time for Q&A. I thought this was a half-hour session, and it's an hour session. So awesome. <laughs> The first thing that I wish I had known about freelancing is that you are not alone. You are not alone. What I've learned over the years in, in having conversations with people who do what we do is that there are very few unique problems. In other words, it's very possible that you've come to an event like this thinking, I'm the only one who struggles with the things I struggle with. I'm the only one who struggles with bad clients. I'm the only one who is totally stressed out about my business. I hear people around here using words I don't quite understand uh, about things that I know a little bit about, but not enough. And they sound so much better at this than I do. Um, I struggle with isolation and the problems that that creates when you work alone. You know, freelance, we all struggle with isolation. What happens is we get blind spots because we're the only one we're working with. We don't have a team. We, we get stagnant because we do things the same way because we're not challenged by other people. Uh, we get lonely. Anybody experience those things? We're all cut from the same fabric. If you're a freelancer, we all struggle with these things. And you are not alone. How many of you, if you're a freelancer, you will find yourself spending an entire afternoon trying to solve a problem that it really should have taken you about five minutes to solve? <laughs> Yeah, but you're like a dog on a bone and you can't let it go. We all struggle with this. That's an incredibly terrible productivity habit, by the way. Instead of spending a whole afternoon, find somebody that you can hire out for 100 bucks and just get it done, right? Uh, it happens when you freelance because we're alone and we're isolated. Um, we struggle with productivity. How many of you work from home? Yeah, me too. Okay. How many of you here, like, we homeschool our kids, so, like, we're all there. Um, yeah, right? Uh, I've, I've talked to... T yeah, there's a lot of homeschoolers in WordPress. So, um, you know, what's funny about this is I just, in the past uh, two days, I've had conversations with others who are husband-wife teams working in their business. I'm like, how do you guys even... Well, Melanie, you and your husband work together. Not in the same room. <laughs> 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 for, for for the recording, she said, yes, but not in the same room. Uh, and that's so true. You know, so we these are common, common problems. There are very unique, 
a very few unique problems that freelancers have. So let me just you know, set you at ease at the very beginning. It is likely that you come to an event like this and you're surrounded by peers and you think that you are the only one struggling with the way you struggle. I promise, if you let the guard down six inches, you will find that you are in a group of people who struggle with the same things you do. It was a remarkable thing when I entered into a peer group of other business owners and got a business coach. And what that did for me in transforming my business, it was remarkable. Uh, so <coughs> the first one is to encourage you that you are not alone and there is hope and there are people around you who are struggling through the very same things you are. So find a peer group that you can get involved in. I started advanced coaching a few years ago to solve that problem uh, where we put freelancers together in coaching groups uh, and uh, work each other through different problems. So anyhow, you are not alone. Here's the second one. You don't have to know everything. When I first started out in business, I was doing everything. I was doing it all. Back in 95, I was doing some graphic design. I was doing some print. I was doing web design, what little web there was. <laughs> Over time, I started doing some video editing. You know why? Because I knew computers, and I could make it happen, right? And when you're in business, there's a certain point where you're just doing whatever you can to bring in the money, right? How many of you have been there? If it pays, I'm going to do it because the kids got to eat, right? So over time, what I realized was the, the web is really what I wanted to do. So I stopped doing everything else but web design. For several years, that was it. And over time, I started to realize, you know what? Web design is now getting too big. You had to specialize. I'm like, I hate code. I blow things up. You know, it's that stupid semicolon every time that's, you know, and I'm, I, I'm, I blow things up. So I decided, you know, I'm much better at the, the process and client interaction and design side. So I focused on that, and that became what I was good at. Now, here's the problem. When, when you do that, you come to a conference like this, and you get pigeonholed. Like, I'm not a real web developer because I can't write code. How many of you feel that way? Well, all I do is put together themes and plugins. Does that sound familiar? And maybe we feel less than. Here's what I learned. You don't have to know everything. You can't know everything. Web development is too big to know everything and be good at everything. WordPress is too big to know everything and be good at everything. So do what you do best and find trustworthy partners for the rest. You come to a conference like this and you get what they call imposter syndrome. Like if they only knew the struggles I had, if they only knew that I'm really faking it, <laughs> nobody would think anything. But you know what? How many, okay, let's just, can we all be honest here? We're all among friends. How many of you struggle with that very thing, imposter syndrome? Look around you, everybody. Look around you. <laughs> we all have an inner imposter. All of us. And you know, here's the thing. When you've been doing this as long as I have, guess what? It gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse because guess what happens? You start moving in a higher level of people. And now, well, I'm sure not as good as them. And it, 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 it keeps going. It's this human nature thing. By the way, the industrial psychologist in the 70s who coined the term imposter syndrome it was not web development related. It was executives and companies, and the higher an executive floated in the ranks, the more prevalent the syndrome became. It's human nature. So if you come here thinking, well, everybody else knows more than me and whatever, it's okay. You don't have to know everything. Do what you do best and try and find trustworthy partners for the rest. A lot of times we think of the world like this. This is what I know. This is what everybody else knows. Plus, it sort of looks like a death star. And it really is the death. <laughs> this can be the death of your thought process. But here's the truth. Here's what you know. And here's what everybody else knows. And the video projector is not great. But there's intersecting circles in there. You know a little. They know a little. Some stuff you know together. There's something that you do better than anything else. And probably, maybe, better than anybody else in this room. So what is it? What is it that really sets you apart? You know how you find out what that is? Ask your client. You ever thought about doing that? What is it that made working with me a good experience? What is it that you appreciated about this project that we just went through? 
you know what, if you have a great, if you have a great client that you've worked with for a while, just ask. They'll tell you. A lot of times we stop at the testimonial and we don't realize what that testimonial means. Take it to heart. Of, this is what I do really well. So guess what? I need to focus on that and stop trying to be the best PHP developer in the world. I need to focus on design, or maybe I need to focus on being the developer and leave the design to people who don't make things bright pink. Because that's the difference between a designer and a developer, by the way. <laughs> a designer makes things that look pretty but may or may not work. A developer makes things that work but they may or may not be bright pink. You know? <laughs> so figure out what you do best and find trustworthy partners for the rest. There are three types of us, really. I, I mentioned designers and developers. How many of you would say, I'm a pure designer? That's what I do. I'm a designer. Okay, look around you, everybody. Look around you. How many of you would say, I'm a developer? That's it. I'm code, all about code. And the rest of you don't know who you are, right? <laughs> There's a word for you. There's a word for you. I call you and me, I'm in this camp too, an assembler. We do really well at taking good code snippets and decent design and putting them together. And guess what? Solving a problem for the client. And that has incredible value. Incredible value. I'll tell you, the people making good money doing client work for WordPress are doing exactly what you're doing. They're similars. So look, don't be an imposter. Be who you are. You're doing good stuff, and you can do it, and you can relate to the client and solve the client's problem, and that has value. <clears throat> okay, number three. Debt is a ball and chain. Money mistakes will cripple your business. Freelancing is a marathon. If you've got debt, it's like trying to run a marathon dragging a boat anchor. Debt, <laughs> debt is buying something today on the assumption that I'll be able to pay for it tomorrow. And guess what? In the freelance world, you can't make that assumption. Because there are very few freelancers, myself included, that have a stable income stream. Most of us, it's like this, right? There's projects and there's not. There's feast and there's famine. Now, when you bring recurring revenue in, which I'll talk about in a minute, it can help to stabilize that somewhat, but it's still up and down. I've never, I mean, I, I could not go back and give you the same number every month. I mean, I'm always up and down. That's the nature of the beast. Debt will cripple you. So if you're a freelancer, get out of debt as soon as possible. And I say this as a recovering debt-aholic. I spent my 20s getting into debt and my 30s getting out of debt. How many of you, that sounds about like you. <laughs> At the end of my 20s, I was about $30,000 in credit card debt because I was stupid. Stupid. I was spending money with the assumption that one day this is all going to change. And guess what? We finally did, but I was $30,000 in debt. So we took a long time digging out of that hole. Because here's what debt does. Knowing that, I, well, first of all, let me ask this. How many of you know what it's like to sit around in a dark room, maybe over a TV tray like I did, with all these bills out for the month, and you're thinking, well, who's not going to get paid this month? Been there? That sucks. It does. What it also does is this. If you're in business, it makes you take on terrible clients. Yes. <laughs> because you've got to get paid. And you're willing to work for less and work for people who don't appreciate your value that you bring to the table. Because you've got this money stress. Well, guess what happens then? You're working for terrible clients who put more stress on your life. And then that just invades your whole world. And it all comes back to being in stupid debt to begin with. I say this because I've made this mistake. Don't be like me. Don't make this mistake. Debt compounds the stress of the slow times. All right, number four. Build recurring revenue as quickly as possible. This is the key. Without it, it is virtually impossible to have long-term success as a freelancer. Virtually, and I, I chose those words carefully because I don't think you could argue with me and prove me wrong on this. It is virtually impossible to be successful long-term as a freelancer without some kind of recurring revenue strategy. 
For my money, it starts with a WordPress care plan, maintenance plan, management, whatever you want to call it. That's where it starts. So the big picture is I need to figure out how in my business to eliminate recurring expenses, that's debt, and increase recurring revenues. Now if you do that, something miraculous happens. It took me a long time to learn this, but as I started living leaner, spending less money, and making more money on contracts of just recurring revenue, the money was there every month no matter what, I started to be able to pay my salary out of the recurring revenue. Now I wasn't paying myself much, but I could live on that, which meant that I wasn't under stress to find the next project. I could take the projects that I wanted to take and start working with good clients. It all comes from saying no to spending stupid money and stupid debt. Recurring revenue is critical. How many of you guys have ever taken on a rescue project? And by that I mean this wonderful client contacts you out of thin air and the developer they had before, poof, they're gone. I don't know what happened to them. There's like somewhere there's like a Bermuda Triangle of web developers, right? <laughs> and there's like, you'll walk in there and there's all these really poor looking people going, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know. And, and I, don't know, I don't know where they go, but they disappear. They're the disappearing web developer. Um, one, one day I'm going to have a talk called The Case of the Disappearing Web Developer. And I've thought about that a long time because, you know, a lot of times you think, well, why did this developer bail on this client? There must be something wrong with the client. And so, sometimes there is. That was a talk I gave at 11 o'clock, uh, the problem clients. But here's what I've kind of figured out. I think, I think that a lot of reason that these disappearing web developers happen is that somebody starts out with bright eyes about being in the web development space. They love building websites. It's fun, right? I mean, it's kind of, we're geeks, it's fun, right? Come on, it's fun. And we enjoy the technology, and they get in there, and they hit a wall. Boom. They hit a wall. Because it's not, only, it's not good enough just to be good at the code and good at the plugins and WordPress and the whole deal. you got to be good at the business side, too. And if you're not building recurring revenue, guess what happens? You go month after month and you have some work and not some other work and there's no recurring revenue and forget it. I'm just going to work for somebody else. And who gets left holding the bag? The poor client. So if whenever now these days when a client pushes back to me on the cost of a, of a WordPress management contract, I'm like, <coughs> you want me to be around for you next year, right? Because the people who don't charge these won't be around next year. You know, you need to pay me to take care of your website. Not only does it make your website perform better and work better for you, it ensures that I, as your web professional, will be here to take care of you should you need something three months from now, six months from now, a year from now. I'm just about convinced that the disappearing web developers never built in a recurring revenue stream. Never did it. And so they're working for somebody else now. So don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. All right. Number five, focus on process, not heroics. Here's what I mean by heroics. Heroics are those tasks, those processes, those things in your business that depend on what's between your ears to accomplish. You've got to be the hero and make something happen. Now you might say, well, that's what gives me value. I mean, that's why people hire me. And that's true to some degree. But if, if your business is simply run on your heroism to create sites and solve problems, and there's no consistency, if you're running your business by the seat of your pants, in other words, and you're just making things happen, that'll work okay for a while. But eventually, you run out of energy. You run out of time. It's not scalable. So what I encourage people to do is get everything out of your head and onto a list as quickly as possible. Here's why. There's this miraculous thing that happens when you take, let's just say, the process for launching a website. How many of you can launch a website today? You can do it. You can make it live. You can, you've built it. Now you're going to launch it, right? It's something, if you're working with clients building websites, it's something you do at the end of every project, right? 
Do you have a list of exactly what you're going to do in which order when you launch a website? Probably, I'm not going to ask for hands up, but usually it's about half. Why? Well, because I can just do it. Why would I take the time to write this down if I can just do it? There's a book that I recommend to everybody called The Checklist Manifesto. It's a book about checklists. And if a commercial airline pilot who's been flying 40 years still runs the same checklist every time he takes off in the plane or she takes off in the plane, there's got to be something to this. Here's what happens when you start checklisting things. When you pull these processes, how do I set up a Google Apps account? Well, I just go in and do it. No, you one, two, three, four, five. When you take it out of your head and put it on paper, something miraculous happens. It frees up your mind to think about other things. It's a beautiful thing that ha starts to happen. Am I right, Melanie? Melanie's been there. She's doing it right now. She's done it. It, it frees up your mind to think about other things. Also, here's what you'll find. As you're running your checklist every time, say launching a website, you'll discover that, you know what? If I do number eight up here where number three is, then, then this happens differently and it starts to become more efficient. And as you run that checklist more and more and more, you start tweaking and refining and moving things around and all of a sudden you've cut down the time it takes you to launch a website in half because you've made it more efficient. You've gotten it out of your head, out of heroics and into process. Now here's what else happens. When the time comes and it's, it's time to onboard and somebody to work with you, and guess what? If you're doing well working with clients, there will come a day where you'll need to hire a developer or you'll need, if you're a designer, you hire a, a VA like Mickey talks about to come in and, and help you out with some of the development stuff. Or you hire a client support manager to answer those support tickets. Well, you know one of the, and that's, you know that's what you need to do, but for many people who are at that stage, they hit a wall doing that because it would take you too long to train the person to get all this stuff out of your head and into that other person's head. But if it's already in a list, see? It's already, in a, here's something else. There's something that is true of every single person in this room. We are getting older. <laughs> every day right? You will not be doing this forever. Have you thought about what's going to happen if you go to sell your business? You thought about that? Does your business have any value beyond what's between your ears? It does if you have processes and checklists. So now all of a sudden this thing you're doing, you no longer own your job, you own a business. And there's a big difference between those two things. A business has value. Now, it's nice to own your own job and work for yourself. But when I get finished doing all this, I want to have a thing to sell to somebody that has recurring revenue contracts, but that also has processes and things that I've developed over the years. That has value. So focus on process, not heroics. Consistency and checklists make you better. By the way, I write my checklists with my 15-year-old daughter in mind. I want her to be able to read it and do it. If she can read it and do it, pretty much anybody could, right? Okay, number six. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but there are seasons to freelance work. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Ups and downs, slow times, busy times. Don't waste the slow times. Because here's what happens. See if this sounds familiar. It sure hap it's familiar to me. Oh my gosh, I've got so much work to do, I'm totally stressed. Oh my gosh, there's no work coming in, I'm totally stressed. <laughs> right? Yes. How crazy are we? Don't waste the slow times. What I've learned is that there's an alert from the National Weather Service. Well, Lord, help them find them. What I've learned is that the slow times are coming. Listen, the slow times are coming, and the business will come back. It will. I was given this talk in Denver, something similar to this talk, in Denver of last year. And this slide came up, and I had to stop and laugh to myself because just, I mean just, on the plane ride over, I was thinking to myself, gosh, it's really kind of slow right now. 
I wonder if the business is coming back. <laughs> and then the morning of the talk, three p proposals I had came back in. Of course, they all come in at once, right? That's the way it works. <laughs> the business will come back. There are ebbs and flows in business that take people with lots of letters after their last name to understand and make sense of, and sometimes they can't even make sense of it. But there are ebbs and flows in business. I've tried to track it seasonally. There's no, absolutely no pattern, at least for me. Maybe you've got some patterns out there that are seasonal with the kind of people you work with. I don't know. If you can track it, you're awesome. Do it. For me, I've never been able to track it. All I know is that there are seasons in freelance work. So here's what I do. I keep a someday list. And my someday list has all those neat ideas that I pick up at a WordCamp or read about in somebody's blog post or some cool plugin I want to give a try or whatever. And I keep a someday list. And when it gets to be a slow time, I just start working through my someday list. Because that way it keeps me from stressing out over, gosh, there's not enough work coming in. And so I'm doing stuff like rebuilding my own website for a change or I'm testing this new cool toy or something that you know, would have distracted me at other times. Well, now I can focus on it and really spend some time working on it. Just don't let the stress of being busy keep you from enjoying the downtimes. Because here's the beautiful thing about freelancing. If it's slow, you get to take a day off. <laughs> and you don't have to ask your boss. Because you are the boss. So take a day off. It's perfectly fine. If it's slow, enjoy it. It's, it's going to be not slow again at some point, likely in the near future. So enjoy the time. Keep a someday list. Use the time wisely. But don't be afraid to go do stuff with your family, your kids, your wife, your, your friends, your partner, whatever. Take the time and enjoy it. You know, freelancing has enough stresses where we don't need to compound it by artificial stresses. Enjoy the slow times. All right. Number seven. <laughs> Bad clients are never worth the hassle. Ever. Ever worth the hassle. One good client leads to another. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's, it's likely that many of you have had those experiences where you've had to take bad clients just to put food on the table. And that's, you know, we've, we've all been through that, most likely. But when things are going well, and this client comes along, and your radar goes off, your spider senses start tingling, and you're just thinking, there's just not something right... I'm, get, I'm not getting a good vibe about this, but there's a paycheck at the end. Anybody else ever think about, eh, I kind of want to take that job because it's got a few grand on it. Bad clients are never worth the hassle. Here's what happens. When, a, when you let a bad client into your world, they, they may write you a check but it's never, ever going to equal the amount of mental and emotional capital you have to invest to make them happy. And some of them, you can never make happy. It's never worth it. Never worth the hassle. So I got a whole talk on this, but a client meeting is like a first date, and think of it that way. When you're meeting with a client and something just doesn't seem right, I mean, it's been a long time since I dated. I mean, I've been married 24 years this year. But I remember some of my dates. How many of you, you remember those dates and you're going, eh, something's just not quite right here. <laughs> and when you're dating somebody, you always get the best version of that person on the first date that you're ever going to get, right? Think of the client relationship that way. When you're meeting with a client for the first time and the client is rude, that's as good as it gets right there. <laughs> Seriously, that's as good as it gets. You're getting the best version of the client you're ever going to get. So when you see red flags during that client meeting, red flags are like tips of the iceberg. There's a whole lot more underneath. So listen, don't make excuses for the client. You don't have to work with everybody and you shouldn't List, uh, work uh, with everybody. So if you got a bad feeling about a client on that first date, listen to your gut. 
on the other side of that, there's some really great clients out there. Really great clients. And it's almost like, it, I have these conversations a lot with freelancers at events like this or in a coaching call or whatever. And <laughs> a lot of times it'll ha the, the conversation will start like, gosh, you know, I know you, you talk about these great clients who actually, you know, pay what you're worth and they're not a lot of trouble and they just, it, projects just go well. And I've just never experienced anything like that. I think they're a unicorn. Everybody talks about them, but they're not real, right? <laughs> I mean, are they really out there? Are they really real? Yeah, they're out there. You just have to keep looking for them. And then it, it's almost, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You've had bad clients and you have some good clients. It totally changed the way, okay. Tell me if this is your story, because it seems to be a lot of people's stories. It's like, for years I was working with these awful clients. They took advantage of me. They didn't pay me what I was worth. They didn't pay on time. They wanted way more than the scope of work. It was on and on and on. I was never making any money. I was miserable. And then one day I met this client. And they started treating me well. And they paid me what I And like everything changed. It's like this, oh, you walk in this new world of like great clients. Because what happens is that one good client, for whatever reason, I wish I could understand the metric or the whatever, but it's like the universe lines up and all of a sudden more good clients follow. Now some of it is that good clients refer you to other good clients. And I, I learned the lesson a long time ago that good people travel in packs. <laughs> they do. Good people like to refer good people to good people. Right? And so that's some of it, but it's like, I don't know, I don't know what the, the mechanism is here, but when you find that first good client, all of a sudden, more good clients. It's like you, you are now aware of the fact that there is something outside the realm of bad clients, and there really are people who will treat you well and value your work and pay you, you, know, pay you fairly. So, all that to say, if you're in the place right now where you've got really crappy clients, hang in there. Keep perfecting your process, keep perfecting your craft, because one day you will meet a great client and everything's going to change. It will. How many of you, that's your story? You met one, the one good client and everything changed? Yeah, there's several of you out there, same story. And I hear that a lot. All right, number eight. Okay, we're doing good on time. Number eight, don't be a hero. <laughs> I'm going to make a whole talk on this one day. I'm still flushing it out, but... Don't be a hero. And here's what I mean by that. It's good to be helpful. It's good to serve people. You know, I go into every client relationship wanting to, to, you know, to serve them well. However, fixing the client is outside the scope of work. <laughs> and if your self-worth lies in people patting you on the back and telling you job well done, if your self-worth relies upon people needing you, you're in for a world of hurt in the freelance world. And this, this is not a symptom that is just confined to the freelance world. It's probably in other relationships in your life as well. But there is a, a kind of client codependency that I see in working with freelancers where they need to be needed so bad that they'll work late trying to fix a little stupid problem that the client wanted. Or, you know, they'll work weekends or they'll miss their kids' birthdays because the client work was more important because they were getting the pat on the back. Good job, a boy, a girl. Don't be a hero. If you have a tendency towards this, you need strong, strong boundaries in your business. You need to be accountable to somebody who will see that in you and call you out on it. Because listen, there's a whole lot more in life that's more important than building somebody's stupid website. <laughs> and I, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I, I'm, you know, I'm ashamed to say that in the early days, I fed on this. I had the cape and boots and the whole deal. <laughs> I'd say tights, but that might be a violation of the code of conduct, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I, was the, I was the superhero. And I loved the client saying how great I was. And I'd let my family become second priority because of that. Don't do that. That's stupid. It's stupid. 
but there was something in me that needed to be needed. So don't make my mistake, right? Don't be a hero. Don't try to fix the client. <laughs> All right, number nine. Your business should serve you and not vice versa. Freelancing empowers you to set your own priorities. Freelancing is a wonderful thing. I am, I am um, a firm believer in owning your own business, setting your own destiny, doing what you feel like you need to do with your life. And the wonderful thing about WordPress, and this is, <laughs> I don't know of very, other, very many other software platforms or supporting communities that let us do what we do so well. I mean, think about it. They're giving you the tools for free to make money. And there's a whole community of people that support you while you do it? For real? It's an amazing, amazing thing that we have here. But in the big picture philosophy, my, I've always been able to structure my business in such a way that it supported whatever my goals in life were. And I think, you know, my dad could never get his mind around this. He and I, he and I have had long talks about this, but, you know, like he, over a, a period in my dad's life, my dad was a, a sales manager, regional sales manager when he retired, f great at what he did, took care of customers, knew the details, never let anything fall between the cracks. He was the guy you could rely on. Like my dad's tools in his garage are like alphabetized. He's like that guy, right? He is totally, totally 100% reliable. But in the course of three years, he was laid off for 18 months in two different, se uh, two different sections. Like he lost a job he had had for 20 years because he got restructured, had a job for three months, restructured him out of existence again after three months with a new company, and then he's out of work another 12 months before he got another job, eventually retired. And he could never get his mind around, how can you work for yourself? There's no job security in it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Let's think about that for a minute. Well, see, that's the thing. I would much rather be beholden to my abilities and, and what I'm doing than some boardroom table that I have no control over, right? Anyhow, all that to say, we've got this incredible opportunity to structure a business that works for us right now and supports our lives with whatever we want it to do. Like for, for years, I worked with nonprofits, and you know, I was kind of on a sliding scale of you know, 25% of my time to 75% of my time, and the freelancing business made up the rest of that. It let me do what I was called to do and still feed my family. What we do is wonderful. The freelance world is wonderful. And when the time came several years ago when it was time to walk away from that nonprofit, I just ramped back up full time in my business again and never looked back. You know, I, I know people who were in the situation I was in who had to go work at Walmart or work at some retail or whatever and just try their best to make ends meet because when the economy crashed, a lot of people, what I did, struggled with income. I didn't have that struggle because I had a business that could support whatever my life priorities were at that time. So one of the people I was coaching uh, a couple of years ago had as her priority, they're ready to have a baby, right? She's, she started uh, her WordPress business like a lot of us do, which is, you know, I'm doing something else and I built a website for the business I was working for and now everybody's asking me to build websites. Wow, I could do this full time. That was her story. Uh, so she built her business and we started working together in some coaching situations and a couple of these folks know who I'm talking about. Uh, and um, with her permission, I'm telling the story, but she wanted to have a baby and wanted to take six months off to have a baby in her business. So what did she do? She put everything together, she systematized, she onboarded people, and she took six months off to have a baby. Now, how awesome is that? Where else could you do that and then pick right back up where you left off? It's fabulous what we can do. I have another friend who's from Oklahoma, uh, and Chris is um, a remarkable guy. Uh, built a, a WordPress business, and Chris and his family, they have 12 kids, 12 kids. Wow. Two of them are theirs. Ten of them are adopted. Okay. Ten of them are adopted special needs kids. Chris has a WordPress business, and they felt like they needed to move to just outside of Kiev, Ukraine, and work with families with children with special needs. Because in the Ukraine, those folks are not taken care of the way we take care of people here. 
So they moved their family with 10 special needs kids, the others are in college now, 10 special needs kids across the world to do what they felt called to do. And guess what? The WordPress business makes it happen. And some donations, but the WordPress business makes it happen. Now that's awesome. So my question for you is, what's the purpose of your business in your life? Because it's so easy to get so busy in business that that becomes the purpose. It's just my business. But life is a lot bigger than that. What is it that you really want to do? Freelancing will let you set your own priorities. What is it that you really want to do in life and then structure your business around that? That'll, that's transformational. <coughs> okay, one more and we're done. Being busy is not a badge of honor. How you doing, Nathan? Oh, I'm busy. Whew. Busy. How you doing, Mickey? Mickey, oh, I'm crazy busy. Right? Crazy busy. And when somebody tells you that, what do you think of them? Oh, they're busy. They're really doing something. <laughs> There's an article in March 2017 in the Harvard Business Review called Crazy Busy, the New Status Symbol. And they did this research of, um, you know, among people, and they showed them a couple of Facebook profiles, what, fake, uh, Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other talk. Uh, they showed him a couple of Facebook profiles, and one was like the guy's, you know, he's just kind of lounging around, not doing much, you know, whatever. And the other guy's like, oh, he's busy, he's meetings, he's traveling here, going there, doing this, doing that. Which one is the most successful? Without fail. I mean, it was like, I, I can't remember the percentages. I'd make them up. You know, like 78.2% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Have you heard that one? <laughs> I can't remember what it was. But that's like the one, don't believe everything you read on the internet, said Abraham Lincoln. Um, <laughs> but huge percentage of people looking at those Facebook profiles says the guy that's super busy is the more successful one. That's a modern phenomenon. Success, even today, success in Europe is more defined by how much leisure time you have. But today, if I want people to think I'm doing well, I'm busy, crazy busy, crazy busy crazy busy. I am a productivity geek. Like seriously, I, I love personal productivity and I'm always tweaking, refining, doing things to, to improve the efficiency I have in my business. But what's the point of that? It's not to do more work. The purpose of productivity is not to do more work. It's to create margin. Margin. Think about that for a minute margin, time, where if I want to do more work, I can. But if I want to take the afternoon off and hang out with my kids, I can do that too. Yep. Or I can come and hang out at word camp. Or I can do whatever it is that I want to do. The purpose of productivity is to create margin in your life so that you can do with it what you need to do. So being busy is not a badge of honor. Don't forget about what really matters in life. There's a little rule that I put into place several years ago where I would, um, <laughs> I would divide my day into three parts. Every day is morning, afternoon, and evening. My family always got two of those, uh, pardon me, work got two of those parts, my family always got one, right? So if my kids, when they were little, if I, they have a program at school in the morning, I could go. But my wife would know I'm, I'm working that night, though, you know, to make up for it, right? So we had this very simple rule about how I structured my time. And there's sometimes where I'm super busy, and I'm generally like working on a deadline, that I would be working morning, noon, and night. But I was accruing debt. So I owe the family three days. And my wife is very good about reminding me when <laughs> those three days are up, right? Anyhow, all that to say, being busy, not a badge of honor. What, what matters to you in life? What are you trying to do? What's your life about? Structure your business and your time around making that happen because you have the freedom to do it as a freelancer.